Okay, so Stranger Things Season 4 Volume 1 is packed with absolutely incredible moments throughout it. In my opinion, the season really upped its quality and each entry feels like its own standalone film. Divided up into several storylines, we watch as Joyce tries to save Hopper, Eleven attempts to regain her powers and the rest of the group try and stop the new big bad Vecna. Vecna is easily my favourite villain that we've had in the show so far and this nightmarish creature stalks a lot of characters throughout the entire season. Clearly based on Freddy Krueger, we even get a nod to this with a cameo by Robert Englund who is revealed to be the character's father. Vecna is set up early on as an unstoppable force and come the end of episode 1, he's left a side-splitting impression. Trapping his prey in fantasies, he torments them before suspending his victims in the air. Their deaths are absolutely horrible and it really sets him up as an unbeatable evil that always gets what he wants. There's seemingly no way to stop him because he doesn't exist in the real world per se and that's what makes Max's storyline even more enthralling. Early on in the season he sets his sights on her and it's easy to get swept up in the show and believe that she's going to be the next character to die. However, Max makes it out of it and the emotion that comes with it elevates the scene to be my favourite in the entire show so far. We're led to believe there's no way out and thus, when she escapes, it hypes you up even more. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down the scene, the subtle things that they do in it and also, we're just going to discuss why it's our favourite moment in the show. If you agree then smash the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for videos like this every day. With that out of the way, thanks for clicking this, now let's get into Stranger Things Season 4. Now one thing that has a big hangover from Season 3 is the death of Billy. Though he was less likeable than Joffrey, he did still have a moment of redemption when he sacrificed himself to the Mind Flayer's minion body. His death hit Max hard and in this season we discover that she shut herself massively off from her friends. She isn't exactly having the best time at home either and she's basically B Rabbit. <laughs> I live at home in a trailer. Still though, Vecna coming after her is something she'd rather not go through but realising that time is running short, she seemingly accepts her fate. Episode 4, titled Dear Billy, centres around her attempting to stop Vecna from killing her by facing her guilt head on. As Nancy and Robin head out to investigate what happened at the Creel house, Max ends up going out to Billy's grave. She gives a letter to Lucas as a final farewell and goes up to Billy's headstone to say her piece. Here she reads a letter to the chump sorry guy that details the breakdown of his dad and her mother's marriage, how she lost the high score at the arcade, and also her feelings of guilt. She talks about running to him, which kind of foreshadows what's to come. Sometimes I imagine myself running to you. Now I think the biggest issue that Max has is that she's very much stuck thinking what could have been and it's also this regret over his death that weighs heavily on her. Now though we don't know Vecna's true motives yet, it does seem like he picks on people who feel either abandoned, lonely or traumatised. In his speech to Eleven at the end of episode 7, he says he views himself as freeing people from their miserable lives. Vecna describes how humans are just living this monotonous existence, going through cycles and counting down the seconds until the day they die. Max is at one of her lowest points here and though it does seem like she finally gets it off her chest, it's at this point he strikes. The graveyard seemingly changes around her and enrolls what appears to be Billy. Now I must admit, they did get me with this and there were even leaks in the lead up to the show that made it seem Dacre Montgomery was going to be playing Vecna. Theories were abound that the Mind Player poisoned him in Season 3 and that is why he posted photos of himself back in the makeup chair. However, the truth of the matter is, Vecna is weaponizing Max's regrets against her. This dream world is where he torments his victims and it's how he psychologically breaks them. You know, I think there's a part of you buried somewhere deep that wanted me to die that day. That was maybe even... Relieved. However, Max stays strong and makes a break for it. In the outside world though, we see that she's stuck in a dreamlike state, unable to move. Again, we get those Nightmare on Elm Street vibes and across the show, we rejoin Nancy and Robin. Investigating Victor Creel, there are also flashes of Silence of the Lambs. Clarice of course went to visit Hannibal Lecter in the film's most iconic scene and the surroundings at this hospital are perfectly put in place to remind us of that movie. Whereas the other Vecna victims didn't stand a chance, here, yeah, they seemingly find a way to break those trapped in his spell out of it. Now, whereas in the past, the Upside Down has pretty much been a mix of grey, blue and black, here they change things up when we're dealing with Vecna. As Max strolls through the graveyard, the headstones slowly morph around her into the leech-like spires and the colour scheme shifts from night to red. 
Typically, when we think of hell, we imagine bursting fires, red environments, and a blood like almost scabbing to the entire thing. He's a clot that ends up forming within you, and slowly over time, he grows and grows until he finally kills you. Max ends up walking through the Creel house, which has defied the laws of gravity, and here she steps on some spider eggs. They burst open like something from a nightmare, and as we learn in episode 7, Vecna had a fascination with black widows. He strung his victims up around the area, and these look similar to the ones in Alien that Ripley comes across in the director's cut. I think it was the director's cut. I watched both versions so much I don't even know it. Look, you don't care. What you do care about is Vecna, who rolls in at this moment, looking absolutely terrifying. The guy is a complete monster, and as we learn, he was someone who didn't really ever experience love. This explains the way to beat him, and on the outside, Max's friends play her running up that hill by Kate Bush. The song actually holds a lot of meaning because it's about someone who wants to swap places with the person they love. When talking about it, Kate Bush said that a man and woman can't fully understand each other because they're a man and a woman. However, if they swap places, they'd find common ground and would make a breakthrough with one another. This very much represents Max and Lucas, the pair of which aren't really on the same page at the moment. So though the song is a banger, it's, it's a banger, isn't it? It also holds sentimentality to the character. This is why when she listens to it, she also gets flashes of Lucas and the prior scene about the letter. I don't want a letter. We're right here. I'm right here. Bush elaborated that she initially thought the song could be a deal with the devil, but they changed the lyrics to a deal with God because there's more love and kindness related to him. They place the headphones over her ears, and this is when Max slowly starts to fight back. Beckner dangles her in the air, and at this point we get some of the best scenes from the show so far. This is very much a trip down memory lane that's cemented by the love of Lucas and Max, which is what she uses to break free. Max starts running, and I don't care what anyone says, hearing the music blast at this point is absolutely amazing. Still get goosebumps now, and any run in slow motion to a song like this, in my opinion, is epic. For me, it's the classic battle between good and evil, where one side faces almost insurmountable odds. However, with a little help from her friends, Max manages to overpower this almost unstoppable evil, and she makes it out. This basically ticks off all the things that I want from Stranger Things, and I think in the end, it's the perfect scene for the series. You've got a ton of references to 80s classics, a terrifying horror vibe, as scary as f villain, an amazing soundtrack, and also a heart to the whole thing. I think this scene completely knocks it out of the park, and that's why it's my favourite one from the show. Obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts though, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We are on a competition right now and giving away three copies of the Batman on the 15th of June, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the scene. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our predictions for part 2, which will be linked on screen right now. We talk about some of the major ways we think they're going to defeat Vecna, so head over there right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.